I'd like to welcome you all to Spectre Prep's webinar. Is that really Biz 2 chloroisopropyl ether? Potential issues for, issues for EPA methods 625 and 8270. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Amy Williams. I'm the marketing manager for Spectre Prep, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. Uh, and before we begin, I'd like to just get a few housekeeping tips out of the way. Uh, everyone in attendance will receive emails with the presentation slides and links to the webinar recording on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box on your screen and we'll answer them uh, during the Q&A session following the webinar. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. Mark Ferry is the GCMS Technical Specialist for the ECS Division of Spec Certa Prep. He has worked with GC and GCMS systems for over 30 years, and his areas of expertise include EPA 500, 600, and 8000 series GC and GCMS methods. He formed Environmental Consulting and Supplies in 1991, which was acquired by Spex in 2015. And Julian Burton is the Director of Organic Manufacturing at Spex Certa Prep. He has a PhD in Chemistry from Rutgers and joined Spex in 2012. And prior to joining us, he was in R&D performing instrument and detection algorithm design for trace detection systems. Now I'd like to hand the presentation over to Mark. Thank you, Amy. Welcome, everyone. The first thing you're probably wondering is, why would anyone want to hold a webinar on Biz2 chloroisopropyl ether? It's not the most glamorous of subjects, but there is a problem growing and it needs to be addressed. So the, the idea for this webinar occurred to me several years ago um, when I was purchasing this neat material and I noticed the price had gone up from $300 a gram to about $3,000 a gram. So I started looking into why that was. And so I decided at some point to hold a webinar to not only address that issue, but to also clarify some ambiguities that have been uh, existing for this compound and its isomer 2,2-prime oxybiz 1-chloropropane really since I started in mass spec uh, 30 years ago. So we're going to address that, those problems, those ambiguities, and we're also going to propose a solution to these problems. Then finally, at the end, we're going to solicit input from the laboratories and also ultimately to other standards providers with the intent of contacting the EPA um, so we can solve this problem. Okay, now why is Biz2 chloroisopropyl ether important? Well, it's a target compound on EPA methods 625 and 8270. And it's become an issue over the past few years because of the following. Number one, there's been widespread confusion uh, among labs and providers and on EPA methods as to the correct uh, CAS number, name, and structure for this compound and its isomers. Number two, as I mentioned earlier, the cost has risen from $300 a gram to $3,000 per gram. That cost that uh, will be passed on to the labs unless something can be done to bring down the cost. And even more troublesome than the rise in cost is that it is frequently unavailable. It, if you call the order, it will frequently be back ordered, which jeopardizes the ability of suppliers to make mixes that contain this analyte, and then therefore jeopardizing the ability of the labs to obtain standards in a timely manner. Now the first thing is, what, what confusion exists? On EPA method 625-8270, as well as on lab reporting documents, and on certificates of analysis from suppliers, one might see either or both of the following isomers listed. Biz 2 chloroisopropyl ether and 2 2 prime oxybiz 1 chloropropane. Note, these are two separate compounds with different structures and different CAS numbers. To use them interchangeably as if they're the same compound is incorrect, and that's what we frequently see. People mix and match CAS numbers, they use them as if they're the same compound, but they're really not. At this point, I will now turn the presentation over to Julian. Thank you, Mark. Here we see the two isomers uh, on screen. Um, the top isomer is the bis 2 chloroisopropyl ether. Um, and you can see the CAS numbers of the two isomers there are very different. As is typical with, with this sort of compound, we're seeing the difference between a chain and a branched um, substance. And in the bis 2 chloroisopropyl ether, we have one carbon between our chlorine and our oxygen. And in the other isomer, we have two, two carbons between the chlorine and the oxygen. So what does that mean <coughs> when we actually run the sample with the chemicals in it? We see both of these peaks. They're not re resolved on a GCMS system. That's not 
unusual. Like most isomers, you would expect that they're going to have similar physical characteristics, close boiling points. They'll elute closely on, on most columns that we would use to, for the analysis. They have very similar mass spectra. So what we see is that in most cases, you see a sort of either one big peak or a peak with a shoulder. They're not really fully isolated on, on most GC systems. So what that means is that labs will typically integrate a total area of iron-45 and report the result as either bis 2 chloroisopropyl ether or 22 2 prime oxybis one chloropropane Now, what they should be doing is reporting a combined total of both of them, and, and that's one of the issues that, that we've identified. Mark. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the cost and availability problems, which is what really started me on this path. Um, when the price went from $300 a gram four or five years ago to $500 a gram to $1,000 a gram to its current $3,000 a gram price, I started asking, why is this happening? So I contacted uh, domestic suppliers and suppliers abroad, and we believe that the answer to that is that the process necessary to obtain the two-isomer bis-2 chloroisopropyl ether standard from the three-isomer starting material is quite costly. So now I've introduced a new term. There's a third isomer. Yes, there's a third isomer, and that's, I believe, the root of the problem. Apparently, um, when U.S. suppliers obtain this bis-2 chloroisopropyl ether, it actually contains a third isomer, which has been deemed an impurity. So the suppliers, either here or abroad, have to go through some extreme measures, presumably some complex fractional distillation procedure, to remove 90% of this third isomer. So let's talk more about that third isomer. Data obtained by ECS and specs with our in-house GCMS systems in conjunction with information provided by Sepelco application note 18 seems to indicate that the third isomer is bis-3 chloropropyl ether. And the structure of bis-3 chloropropyl ether is shown on the screen. You notice that it has a separate CAS number from the other two isomers and that there are three carbons between the chlorine and the oxygen. And the other two isomers are shown on the right side of the screen. So you can see that they are three distinct isomers, three separate compounds. Let's take a look at the chromatography you would obtain. On the top figure is the two isomer standard that ECS and specs and virtually all suppliers have been using. You notice that you see two. On our system, we have a, a high resolution column. We're able to separate. Actually, you see all three isomers. You see two sharp peaks. And then you see the third little shoulder on the right here. That's, that's the third isomer. If you were to buy the three isomer standard that has not had the purification process, you see three distinct peaks. So in both figures, the first two isomers are bis-2 chloroisopropyl ether and 2-2-prime oxybis-1 chloropropane. I don't know which isomer is which. For the purposes of this webinar, it really doesn't matter because as Julian said, you're going to integrate the combined area and report it as a sum. So you can see on the top chromatogram, that third isomer is a very small blip on the shoulder of the second peak. It's only about 2.5% of the total area, where on the bottom, the unpurified three component isomer, the third isomer is 25% of the total area. And we know what the isomers are because when we do a library search of both chromatograms, it comes up with a 90% match with bis-3 chloropropyl ether in our NIST library. So that led us to conclude that what's happening is the raw material has the three isomers and suppliers are now going through a process to remove 90 plus percent of that third isomer. Okay, we have three isomers. Now what? The, the, as I told you, they're removing this third isomer, so that raises three questions. Number one, why are they doing this? Number two, is this bis-3 chloropropyl ether truly an impurity? And three, why not just provide the three isomer mix? And on the screen, you can see that those of you familiar with EPA methods 625 and 8270 will recognize this, the mass spectrum there as the bis-2 chloroisopropyl ether. And on the top screen, you get a zoom in. You can actually see the, the shoulder of the second peak, which is that third isomer to which we've been referring. Okay, so let's answer those questions that I just posed. Why are they doing this? In my opinion, it's just because it's the inertia that has always existed in the industry. I've been doing GCMS since 1985. This was when I started doing method 625. And on every EPA method I've ever seen, on every lab reporting document I've ever seen, when I got into consulting, I would go from lab to lab throughout the United States. 
I would see certificates of analysis from other suppliers. The only two compounds I ever saw were bis-2 chloroisopropyl ether and 2-2-prime oxybis-1 chloropropane. There was no mention of the third isomer, and probably, most of you probably didn't even realize it existed until just now. So it's understandable that suppliers would continue along that path unless there was some motivation, some reason to change, namely the EPA changing the EPA 625 and 8270 methods. In the absence of that, it's unlikely that there's going to be any, any change. Next question, is the bis-3 chloropropyl ether truly an impurity? Well, no. It's not an impurity. It's a third isomer that would naturally appear if the other two isomers were present, if you would ever find it in a natural industrial sample. Third question, why not just provide the three isomer mix? Well, that's what we think should be going on. Since the three isomer mix, in our opinion, would represent what a lab might find if it had an industrial waste sample, a real-world sample that they're analyzing in their lab, it seems logical that if the material in the, in the, in the uh, in environment has three isomers, then the calibration standard also should have three isomers. So why is the three isomer standard superior? Well, the material itself is easier to synthesize. It doesn't require quote unquote purification. Because it doesn't require the purification, it's readily available at only $300 a gram, not $3,000 a gram. And it doesn't have availability issues because it doesn't have to go through this fractional distillation process. Most importantly, it, it best represents what a lab might see in a real-world sample. So we've been using this two-component uh, bis-2 chloroisopropyl ether for 30-plus years. In actuality, they've been removing this third isomer, which we now think that they should not have been doing. We should have been using this three-isomer standard all along. So better late than never. We're finding you know, it came to light only because the cost went up so high, but now we're aware of it, I think that we should make some changes. Now, what about quantitation? You might think to yourself, okay, what if we were to have this three component um, standard and we had a PT uh, sample that only had the two component standard, would we, able to, would we be able to uh, quantitate it accurately and get accurate PT results? Well, the answer is no. Uh, there's a difference in the responses between the two and three isomer standards. In the two isomer mix, ion 45, which is the quant ion, represents about 39% of the total area. In the three isomer mix, ion 45 represents only about 35% of the total area. So that's a 12% built-in error right there. Now the reason for that is, is because in that third isomer, bis-3 chloropropyl ether, ion 45's abundance relative to the total ion chromatogram is slightly less than it is in the other two isomers. There's more ion 41. That's just the fragmentation pattern of that particular compound is that you get more 41 and it comes out at the expense of ion 45. That causes this skewing in the quantitation. So unless the proficiency ampules and the calibration standards are both of the same type, you're going to get a 12% built-in error and that's obviously not good. This is why it's important that the entire industry decide whether we want to stick with the two component uh, isomer mix or switch to the three isomer mix. So where do we go from here? Well, that really depends on the labs. We don't have uh, the power to change the EPA methods, only the EPA does, but what we really need is a consensus in the environmental industry in order to affect some kind of change. So we want to contact other suppliers in the industry and ultimately to the EPA with the hopes that they will change the methods and make it state unequivocally you should have a three isomer standard and you should sum the entire area of ion 45 over those three isomers and report the sum. In order to do that, we need to get some input from the labs. First of all, we've presented our opinion on this. this is, none of this is a fact. This is just our opinion that the three isomer mix would be superior. Now that you've heard our opinion, we'd like to know your opinion. You've been doing these methods for many years. You, you're used to the two isomer mix. Do you agree with us that we should, the industry should switch to the three isomer mix, or would you rather just stay with the two isomer mix? So we'd like uh, you to email us with your opinion on that. The other thing I'm interested in is, have you ever found any of the bis-2 chloroisopropyl isomers in any sample? If you have, do you remember if you found one isomer, two isomers, or all three isomers? Just trying to get a feel for how prevalent this compound is in, in nature. So my email address is right there on the screen. Uh, if you could please email me with your opinion, and if you've ever found these, um, this compound in any samples, we'd appreciate it. 
Okay, I'll turn this back over to Amy. Okay, thank you very much, Mark, and to Julian. We do have a few questions that we'd like to, to have answered now, so I'll uh, ask Mark, uh, what do you plan to do with all the feedback we receive from the webinar? All right, what we plan to do is, you know, if, if there's not a, an overwhelming consensus among the labs, then we probably won't do very much. However, if the overwhelming consensus is that the labs, you know, think that the three isomer mix is uh, superior, we then we're going to start proceeding with this. We're going to contact other suppliers uh, who make this mix, get their opinion on it. And if we get enough labs that are interested in change and enough suppliers that are interested in change, then we're going to contact the EPA and try to get the methods changed. Are there any other compounds that you have seen with similar concerns? Um, well, there are other compounds that are quite expensive. Some of the PAH neat materials can be seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a gram, but I don't know of any compound on the uh, EPA 500 or 600 or 8,000 series methods that are anywhere near three thousand dollars a gram. Um, I'm also concerned that if something doesn't happen that this these compounds could be four or five thousand dollars a gram in another couple of years if they're even available at all. So, to my knowledge, this is the only compound um, where the price has gone up, you know, drastically over the last few years, and where availability has been a problem. So, I think it's limited to just this one compound. Does this compound have another name? Um, I, the, the question is, I cannot find it in the, the NIST MS 2011 library. Um, well, when we did our search, we actually found all three. If you go back to the slide here, if you look on the bottom, um, if, if, I do a, if you do a background subtracted mass spectrum of the first peak, you'll, it will come up either bis-2 chloroisopropyl ether or 2-2-prime oxybis-1 chloropropane. If you do, the, the mass spectra are so similar that if you do a mass a library search of the second peak, you'll come up with the same two results. And if you do a, a library search of the third peak, you can't really do it on the top one because it's at such a small a peak, but if you do it on the bottom one, on the three component mix, if you were to do a library search of this one, you would come up with a 90% match of uh, bis-3 chloropropyl ether. So um, I had the 98K uh, library and the system had no problem at all identifying all three isomers. Okay. And we have uh, another question. When you say 8270, what revision number and date are you quoting? Um, I actually don't have an answer for that. I just, you know, there's so many revisions. This is just the method. This is just the standards that we've always used. To my knowledge, there's been no changes in this compound in any revisions. If anyone knows of any revisions of the EPA methods where this compound is addressed, we, that would certainly factor into what's going on here. So, you know, please email us with that. If, you know, to my knowledge, they, they just list these compounds. There's no mention of the third isomer, but if there is, we'd like to know about it. Um, and one more question, or question. Um, as, as per your explanation about the isomers, I think that the EPA has to agree that the three isomers can be found in real samples, not only one. Is that true? Well, I've been in GCMS for 30 years, and I can honestly say that at, at, at no lab that I ever work at or consulted for that I ever find this compound. So it seems logical that if when it's manufactured you get the three isomers that if it were to show up in an industrial waste sample that you would see three isomers but I have no direct experience with it which is why I was asking for people to tell us what have you seen I've never seen any of these isomers in any sample I'm just saying what if it were to be present it seems more logical to me that you would see all three isomers but I, I can't say for sure I'm hoping that some of you will have, some of you who are in the lab will have seen this compound and I'll trust what you tell me with regard to this one more question, Mark? Sure. What are typical spiking levels for these methods? Uh, typically uh, anywhere from 50 to 100 ppb for water samples or 250 to 500 ppb for soil samples. Okay. Well, thank you very much again to Mark and Julian. Uh, I'm going to be sending out the slides for this presentation to everyone a little bit later today, so you'll be getting those by email. And you'll also be getting a copy within a week or so of the recording of the presentation. Uh, so we very much appreciate you attending this today, and we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Thank you.